Hello and welcome. I'm Sophie Tedling and I'm a Bellingcat Technical Fellow. Today we're going to look at PeakVisor as a tool for open source investigation. We're using the term open source investigation rather than intelligence because investigation is closer to what we do. There are no associations with uh, spying or anything like that. Today we're going to basically learn to drive PeakVisor. So we won't earn our license, particularly until this afternoon. We will look at the basic controls. These are the prerequisites for this tutorial. You're here now, so don't worry about them. But we're hoping that you have a basic understanding of open source investigation, uh, an interest at least in geolocation, and that you've got some, it'd be useful if you'd use Google Earth and if you'd uh, read the article on the website, but um, it wouldn't be the end of the world either way. Here is our program. We're going to have a mix of theory where I'm trying to do some animated graphics to make that less dry. Lots of practice where we're actually going to use the tools together. Um, lots of exercises where we check whether we're all on the same page. We're going to look at some different locations that everybody knows, uh, at least Mount Rushmore is very famous, Ben Nevis maybe a little less so, places that we're familiar with. So let's kick off by what is PeakVisor? Well, it's more than one thing. It started off as a smartphone app, and that's for locating yourself in the mountains. So. This is, this is what Peak Visor looks like on a smartphone. And that's very beautiful. It's augmented reality. It does some of the things that we're interested in for open source research, but it's also an app that's waiting for inputs like uh, what your uh, phone can give, which is uh, to do with the way that it acts like a compass and things like this. So. It's a bit misleading for us. We need other uh, aspects of PeakVisor to be amplified for us. That's why there is a version that is being developed for open source research, which is on uh, the website. And that renders 3D terrains from 2D maps and some altitude data. I've called it a geospatial information system. Google Earth does the same thing. It's a class of apps. And it's this web version that is the one that we're going to be talking about today. It's also a web app that's unusual in that it's being developed specially for open source investigation. So that is leading mainly from, at the moment, social media. Uh, and there is a, an Twitter X, X Twitter account, which is managing that and putting out information. And I'll show you that in a moment. But it's also important to remember that PeakVisor is a work in progress. So that means it's being developed very fast. It's being developed for us. And it also means that it's probably uh, a little bit wobbly. It's not got the power of Google behind it. So we should probably be uh, expecting a few bumps along the way as we use PeakVisor today. We also, on the flip side, that can be something that's quite exciting. So the work in progress part means that its functionality is changing all the time, which means that even if you're quite an experienced PeakVisor user, I'm hoping you'll get something from these sessions because the PeakVisor people aren't necessarily publishing all the different new functionality as it happens. It's moving a bit faster than that. So what's a geospatial information system? Well, in principle, we have this kind of problem when we're looking at geolocation. We've got some sort of imagery, open source. We found it easily. We haven't necessarily paid for it. It was out there. and the location on the map. We just want to know where that is to a greater or lesser accuracy, depending on our problem. Why is that difficult? Well, mainly it's a matter of angle. It's your point of view. 
the maps are looking from above. If you're a satellite or a drone, then your imagery may well correspond, although drones don't often take pictures directly downwards, with what you'll see on open source imagery. But generally, you're on the ground and you're looking sideways. So you've got a 90 degree problem, haven't you, in what you're looking at? And that's tough. And the obvious thing we need in the middle of all of that is some sort of model that allows us to pivot, to relate to both. And those are usually 3D rendered models of the terrain. That, I don't know whether it looks so nice for you. It looks it looked quite nice as an original picture. It's a mesh. So it's um, as though someone's put a net over the top of some mountains. And it's there to represent the fact that it's map data plus elevation data, the altitude data that gives us the third dimension that gives this proper 3D shape. And it's that that is the thing we can pivot about. That's the missing link. That's why we can do geolocation with these tools. It gives us the extra info. So the geospatial information system relates the mesh to the map. But we need something else. So far, we haven't got AI right behind this problem. We need a person to relate the image to the 3D model. And anything that makes this bit work better, that makes this look more like something we can recognize, with our fallible human eyes, that's going to make the geolocation job much easier. The relationship between the 3D model and where you are on the map is something that the geospatial information system deals with very well. So they've got this bit covered, but we need to make this bit as efficient as possible for us to do very good, accurate geolocations. And here is our little disembodied eye having an epiphany where it realizes that geolocation is actually working through this 3D rendered terrain model. So let's go look at Peak Visor now. You can join me when we're doing any of these exercises, just work alongside me. If you have two screens, it's going to be a lot easier. So let's just go to Peak Visor. Here it is in all its glory in Firefox in this case at https peakvisor.com. We'll go past the first page, which I'll talk to you about later, and we'll just go straight to explore the mountains. And what we're looking at here is that, lo and behold, the two things we were talking about, the map over here, flat map from above, and the 3D rendered model here, mm -hmm. You can move around it. I'm just dragging and dropping the background to do this. I'm spinning around. We've got both views. And having those together on one page, rather than flipping endlessly between them, is something that's very helpful. So I'm going to expand this so we can look very closely. It will resize, unfortunately. Usually it's not needed. Using the scale to zoom back in, this is my map. It's actually um, an open street map. You can see that by uh, the copyright down here. It's got lots of paths. Some of them are legacy from the purpose of Peak Visor originally. They're very much focused towards hiking and mountain climbing and skiing. And I can tell you that the developers of Peak Visor are very enthusiastic mountaineers and climbers and hikers. So they're putting all the paths, all the ski trails, but they're also putting very, very good data for open source research. It's not just about skiing. We can see all sorts of detail here. When we finish with that, the flat one from above, we're looking in the same place in this 3D model. And This is unusual. If you're using Google Earth, then you have to zoom out, zoom back in, zoom out, zoom back in. 
it's a lot easier if you've got the two of these together at the same time to keep track of what you were doing. So peak visor keeps changing and therefore we're posting short information videos all the time to try to demonstrate what's going on. This isn't um, the best quality, I'm afraid, because you ought to be able to read this little URL up here. They're very important in Peak Pfizer, but this is just, they're usually oh, less than a minute with lots of uh, illustration and instruction just to tell you what's going on. And so now I'm gonna show you uh, the real thing which is here. This is the at PV for OSINV account. And here you can see lots of different little videos that you can look at and they will change. And one thing that's true of Peak Visor is true of open source investigation as well is that things are changing so fast that I'm putting more emphasis than many people would on the theory because the actual way that this thing works is moving so fast. So it's best to understand the principles because it's never going to look the same twice. Don't worry about all the detail here. I'm going to show you a few things that show a lot of detail. I'm always going to say what it summarizes because you will have all of this information afterwards. And the important thing is that you just get the fact that this is the size of the issue. So. The obvious things that you might use if you're trying to do geolocation are the Google suite of tools. That's not just one tool, there's Google Maps. That's focused on the street views, on photography, uh, sewing together the uh, street views very well. And really very, it's good in very densely populated areas. Google Earth Web is in beta version at the moment. That's something that's great for collaborative work. We're going to look during the next two days at, at one particular illustration where we use a, a Google Earth Web map. And Google Earth Pro, which is the one that Bellingcat makes you download when you do your training, as I did just over a year ago with Bellingcat. And they say you must download onto your machine this huge thing called Google Earth Pro. It's an amazing piece of software. It's well worth having. Um, it just doesn't do everything, nothing can. It has a huge user base, it has a long history, it has the fantastic addition of different images over time, which Peak Visor doesn't. But we can also use Peak Visor to complement Google Earth Pro, and in some areas, it's actually stronger. So, the only point I'm trying to make with this big, complicated looking thing is. Each of these meets different user needs. And the only one that's been developed totally for open source investigation is PeakVisor. So now we're going to do an exercise. We will look at the Matterhorn. Here are the coordinates of the Matterhorn, but Peak Visor knows where it is because it's a mountain and it has a database. So first of all, we're going to fill this in. We've got uh, a poll that we can use. I think it's quite a nice way for us to stay in touch during this whole webinar. But I've also just put the first one up so you can see. And we're going to look at the same place in two different areas in, in two different tools. One is Google Earth Pro and the other one is Peak Visor, and we can compare the views. So I'm going to launch the poll just so we can see what they look like. And you should get a little set of questions that you can answer. Take your time. I'm going to give you a few minutes, go into Google Earth Pro, find the Matterhorn, have a look around, see if you can answer these questions. Then try Peak Visor, do the same thing. And we'll go through it together in a few minutes. If we take Google Earth, 
ask it for the Matterhorn. Uh, all these places, all these tools have a, a database, obviously. Sometimes it can be terribly misleading. Often it's very useful. It tends to plop you on the summit of the mountains, which isn't always that helpful. So here I am in an overhead 2D map-like view, but actually I can tilt uh, according to whether, as though I were a satellite, so I can change my angles. I can also physically move, but I don't particularly want to do that. And I can go in and out. So that's useful. And if I place where I'm interested in in the center, then that tends to zoom me in and out. So I definitely have an overhead 2D map-like view. No doubt about that. Can I find a 3D ground level view? Well, the obvious way to do it is the one that we're used to from Google Maps, which is this. Right. Hmm. Switched on terrain. Hmm. It's not so it's not so useful at the moment. Let's see if I can. So maybe if I come out and I zoom right in, which I like doing. I dive bomb into the center. So for that, you need to make sure that you're not um, automatically entering ground level view and you're not automatically tilting in the Google Earth settings. But if you want to do that, then you need to be pointing directly downwards. and then dive bomb in. Watching your elevation down here, your eye altitude down here. And then you can start to look upwards and look around. You're very low level, but that's not bad. That looks quite useful. So I can find a 3D ground level view. I can't put them side by side very easily. I have to zoom back out to find out where I was. I can read my latitude and longitude. They're very small down here. You can see them very comfortingly changing as I move the mouse around. Uh, it's one of the ways of knowing that pre visor is overloaded is when the um, values don't change very quickly. So you'll see that more with peak visor than Google Earth usually. I can also get my latitude and longitude by choosing a point uh, and looking at its coordinates. So if I put myself a little point in here, stick it there. I automatically have the latitude and longitude there. So that's pretty good. Can I read my compass bearing? Well, if I draw a line, I can look at its um, orientation. It will give me a heading on a line if I draw a line. So, Yes, but it's a bit fiddly. Uh, if I change my orientation to point at the Matterhorn in the 3D ground level view, can I see my direction change? Well, probably only if I zoom in, draw a line, look at its orientation, Uh, and it's drawn me quite a funny line there. So if I went right out, drew a long line, I could maybe do a measure line. That might disappear when I went back up to the top though. Google Earth has a very good feature where it's actually drawing the line along the ground. You can see it go up and down. So I've got a heading on there. Quite 
fiddly though, quite fiddly. Uh, so let's go to peak visor and try to do some of the same things. So overhead map view, 3D ground view, yes, can see them side by side. My latitude and longitude are in here. And they're also, if I'm not at somewhere the database knows, up here, they'll appear in the URL. But because this is a database location, they aren't shown. But they will always be behind this. So yes, I can get to those quite quickly. Can I read my orientation? Yes, beautifully, I just read it here and watch it change, that's great. Uh, if I change my orientation, can I see where I'm pointing? I don't know if you've had this problem, but when you find little photospheres on Google Earth, they're marvelous. But when you get down and look at them, the thing you desperately want to know as an open source researcher is where were they pointing the camera? And you don't know. And what you'd love is for the photospheres to have one of these little arrows on the top because we can see everything change. So that's nice and useful. So if we go back to our poll here, I would say um, that yes, both, yes, both. You're not seeing the views side by side. You can read that information. You can read it with Google Earth, so it's maybe not fair to give it across, but it's not as easy. And you definitely get to see which way you're pointing a bit easier all the time as a readout in um, Peak Visor. So there's nothing that Peak Visor does here that Google Earth doesn't do, but it does deliver things in a very fresh and accessible way. So Peak Visor is really solving for us the helicopter problem. You want to be down on the ground looking at your image, looking at the detail, trying to recognize things in the 3D model, but you also want to be above knowing which way you're looking and which way you're turning. And Peak Visor really is a help with that. And I think you have to do a bit of work with it to, to appreciate it fully, just what a difference that makes. So when we're learning a new tool, it takes time. And there are so many tools out there and it has to be worth it. So I've chosen five features here that I think I just want to run through with you. We will do them in more detail later, but just to say to you, this is why I think it's worth learning Peak Visor because there are so many other ways you can spend your time. But these I think are the five crucial features that make it worthwhile. So the first is the data. Peak Visor's data comes from numerous sources. Many are similar to uh, Google Earth's. Interesting sources aren't always totally up to date because satellites don't see everything. And for example, there's a very interesting article in a version of Wired from a while back, which is talking about the end of the old Soviet Union and that some of the maps then are still today uh, some of the most highly detailed of certain areas. So I think the Peak Visor people buy these kinds of things uh, and the real skill comes in putting all these tiles of information together, uh, especially at the joins. And that's what the Peak Visor team spend a lot of time doing. You can sometimes in both Peak Visor and Google find little edge mistakes where the terrain looks rather strange because it's actually the join between two separate uh, data sources. I'm going to show you quite a, an obvious one uh, later on today, but uh, you can also see them in Peak Visor. Nobody's perfect. But this Peak Visor data is the thing that makes it competitive because it gives us the best chance of recognizing the 3D rendered view. 
and seeing it as the same area as our open source imagery. So I should also say that PeakVisor makes its data available through uh, an API. There's a simple one that just lets you embed a PeakVisor view, but coming now because it was requested through the Popsy project is uh, something on a website page, which is going to allow you to download a square of information from anywhere within the PeakVisor uh, world map. This is just to represent all the work, all the sewing together. That's really what it is of all these different slices of information. It's not just satellite imagery. It's all kinds of things to try to get uh, the best view for everyone. So all this data accuracy, what does it mean for us as open source researchers? Well, this is our problem. Here is uh, a piece of open source imagery. I created it. It is uh, a video composite. Therefore, it was made of lots of little tiles of different stills from a video. This is taken in Tajikistan after a period of uh, unrest in a particular area, which has a history of some unrest and violence. And there were many people killed at this time. It's around the May, 2022. It's a very sad image because these pixelated images are actually the bodies of people who, which are going to be buried according to Muslim tradition. And I've added these features here just to highlight some of the things that are distinctive about this image. And when we try to geolocate this, this is what we find in Google. Now look here, we have the absolute advantage that we can look at the area over time, but this is an area that doesn't have very much uh, imagery other than 3D rendered stuff. It doesn't have loads of photographs. So ask yourself if you'd have recognized this area and compared the photograph and Google's 3D rendering. It's difficult to say. A lot of these features here, I always thought of that as a little teapot lid because I'm British and it looks like everything looks like tea to me. And this is a little snaggle tooth rock. It's a very strange shape. And this is a characteristic angle. So I was looking at all of those and looking to find those. Right, so that's the peak visor version. And what I wanted to do was to slide them in and out, but PowerPoint's not playing. But this is considerably more recognizable. Each of those features is actually distinctive here. So the question is, is that really different data or is it a different treatment of the data? I think in this case, it is actually more detailed data. But there's one other explanation, which could be that Google, in order for you to be able to slide around that 3D model very easily, Google has a smoothing algorithm. And the smoothing algorithm is great for all sorts of things. But actually, it's not great when we're trying to recognize 3D rendered terrain. And of course, the full page of Peak Visor goes, this is my arrow, look, here's where you are on the map. So that's what Peak Visor is offering. That's the difference. And it's what we said was happening. We've got the map here. We've got the 3D rendered model here. Only Google's wasn't very recognizable in this case. We've got the open source imagery. And this part's the key. And in this case, Peak Visor helps us when Google can't. So I always, when I'm doing these, I leave the joins because I don't want to forget that this is a composite image. It rather matters because we'll go later into the way that the focal length of a camera changes the way we can photo fit it. But effectively, this is lots of different photographs that aren't necessarily taken at exactly the same location. The photographer may have moved a little bit, take your video. And they aren't necessarily taken at the same level of zoom. So that would alter things for us as well. So I leave the joins deliberately to show that if there's something a little bit off, 
about the way that uh, this looks relative to the rendered image, it's because this isn't a perfect rendering of the photograph taken at the time. So that's our photographic image. Compare peak visor over here and compare Google over here. There's definitely an advantage. So Google remains a little bit questionable. Remember, the whole place looks like this. It's full of mountains. We just need something distinctive. And that would be true of coastlines. And it would be true of anything that has a distinctive skyline. It doesn't have to be anything to do with altitude. Whereas over here, peak visor, yeah, I think there's a few features there that the, the eye and the brain just catch on to. And those are the things that make the difference between you finding your geolocation and not. So the second good point for Peak Visor is that it has contours, very clear contours that you can actually see quite well. And the contours exist in, for example, Google Maps. Uh, they tend to blur in and out a little bit. But here on Peak Visor, it's all in the same place, which is handy. And remember, the contours are simply drawing an ISO line where everything's the same height so that you can see from the 3D onto the 2D, yes, look, these are the areas of the same height. And you know that if the contour lines are close together, it's a big slope. Things are changing quickly. If there's no contour lines at all, it's flat. So no surprise here. Here's a river valley. Uh, here are the flat bits where people live. Here's the river, but this is steep. Peak visor goes down to, I think, uh, 10 meters apart. And one of the most useful things is also about lines of sight. So this is an actual peak visor screen dump. And we can also see in an application like Map Carter, which is the same stuff, but it has a horizontal scale, something that's coming soon in Peak Visor, which is uh, the horizontal scale that we would find very useful. That's a very good example of uh, spellings being a problem if you are working in an area where they're all transcribed from a, a different uh, alphabet anyway. So here we can see we not only get these, but we also get this scale. So you can do a very quick um, estimate of gradient using that and Peak Visor is about to incorporate that very soon. The point of knowing the slope of the ground is that if you're searching a huge area and there's something distinctive about the slope in your open source imagery, that's another way to match things. Not necessarily to support a particular place, but to exclude all the others. And excluding the wrong place turns out to be as important as including the right one. The other huge issue is lines of sight. So the contours tell us whether there's anything in the way on the land. It doesn't necessarily mean that there's not a skyscraper because we may not have picked that up. But it does mean that the land itself, the horizons, we can tell whether we should be able to see something in a, an image or we shouldn't. So you can obviously see stuff where there's nothing in the way. And you obviously shouldn't be getting this in your image uh, if there's something in the way between the place you think you're standing and uh, the place that you're seeing. Is higher ground blocking the view is the real question. There's also the idea that when you're looking at terrains where there's no obvious reference point, like a human or a sheep, or an obvious tree, although they can vary greatly in size. It's a flat image. 
you can't necessarily know looking at your flat image what you're seeing. Is it small or far away? Is it large or close by? Humans can't tell without some sort of reference point. And that's important for us uh, when we're doing open source investigation. Peak Visor solves the problem. You can point at anything in your 3D image and it will tell you the distance. Now, Google will do that, but it's very hard in the 3D image. You can do it from above in the helicopter image, no problem. But in the 3D image, it won't reliably do that. And that's a very quick way for you to get a feel of, of where you actually are. So here's the mountain on molehill problem. Um, this is the same image of the Statue of Liberty, maybe some snow in places, but it's the same image at different sizes. We have no context. The minute we have some more visual context, our perception of depth, depth changes completely. So now we can see that the Statue of Liberty is actually large and far away out of the window. Here, it's a snow globe, very, very close to us. Without context, we can't do that. So in terms of our flat image, these are the same. And we need to know that when we don't have the context, we actually make that mistake sometimes in terms of what we're looking at. And Peak Visor can very quickly help us overcome that. I'm not going to cover this in huge detail today. I'm just going to say to you it's there because effectively it is Peak Visor incorporating another tool into one, which is the idea that you can follow sun and moon trails and do chrono and geolocation from the position usually of the shadows, not the sun. So quick recap, Earth, equator, latitudes, plus, minus for north and south. Longitudes can be expressed in, in two ways. Uh, you either subtract from 360 when you're going west or you uh, go eastwards and call it minus. I always look and think west, left, that's best. That really helps me. And I learned a name I had to share with you, which is a graticule. These little squares where the latitude and longitude are put together, this is a graticule. graticule. So are any uh, of these little squares that we put on a map. So just, just use graticule today because it's quite a nice word. So what's really happening for us is that we know that uh, sun rises in the east, sets in the west. And what we're interested in, in open source research, this is a predictable thing, is the fact we're sitting there and we can cast shadows. And those are going to tell us uh, where we are or the time. Uh, they are the thing that we use. We can't often see the sun as much as we can see the shadows. And there are a couple of good references that could go in the chat. Uh, of articles by uh, Bellingcat people talking about how to use uh, the sun for geo and chronolocation. There are two measures that we need for the position of the sun. One is its horizontal angle from north, the azimuth angle. And the other is the elevation of the sun. Is it high in the sky, low in the sky? And again, there's quite a nice video on this that I can recommend and we can put in the chat to show it, but that's how high the sun is. And my little yellow man is mad to be out there and start casting shadows. We're going to cover this later, but there is a way of using the height of the person in the image or the object, the height of the shadow it casts to work out the angle of elevation of the sun. It's not that complicated, it's trigonometry. Uh, getting it right in real life, I've tried, is quite hard because you need to these to be square onto you. So if you've done that, you'll know uh, that it's not as easy as it looks, but nevertheless, that's there. 
So we will come back to the whole sun calc thing and uh, actually show how it works yeah, this afternoon, I think, if not tomorrow. So the thing most people know about peak visor, the fifth reason to really get uh, excited about it is the photo fitting. And photo fitting works like this. You've got your digital image and your 3D rendered panorama. You usually just take the outline and you superimpose it on the digital image. If it fits, it's like Cinderella and you're going to the ball. But of course, it's more complicated than that. It's more complicated because there's obviously a real focal length, degree of zoom that belongs to this photo. We probably don't know it because most open source imagery is stripped of that data. If it's there, that's wonderful. But even in a 3D rendered image, there is an inherent and implied uh, degree of focus and those need to match. So rarely in life is it as simple as we simply take one and impose on the other. There's quite a lot of adjustment to do and it has to be legitimate adjustment. And of course, really what you want to do is to be able to move your position whilst looking at this match to make it better. Because that's what geolocation is about. We're making our guess at location more accurate. And that's something that's just come to Peak Visor, where you can move your location whilst you're looking at this photo fit. And that's a massive step for us in terms of accuracy, which uh, you'll probably see tomorrow. So here is the um, page in Peak Visor that helps you do photo fit. And if you had pulled an image in and you have generated your outline, then this is more likely what it's going to look like. It, you could have to rotate a great deal uh, before you get to that stage. But eventually, you would be generating a photo fit. So let's watch somebody struggle to uh, use Peak Visor to make the match. So you can drag and drop that outline image. You're trying to get it to fit perfectly. You can use mouse scroll in and out to change the focal length. And you can use the little handles that Peak Visor gives you. This is just looping, by the way. Gives you the handles that Peak Visor gives you to change other things about it. So you have a lot of degrees of freedom, lots of things to mess with, trying to get your photo fit. And in life, I don't like to think how much time I have spent trying to get photo fits out of Peak Visor. But of course, once in a while, it turned out to be the only way to geolocate anything. So I hope that I've persuaded you that um, there are at least five good reasons to get involved with Peak Visor. It does things more easily, quickly or accurately for open source, some open source investigations. So let's do an exercise to explore the differences a little bit between what we can do with Google Earth and what we can do with Peak Visor. So we're going to compare what we can see in Google Earth and what we can see in Peak Visor uh, at the Lincoln Borglum Visitor Center, which is in the very much photographed area of Mount Rushmore. And what we're going to look at is um, a photograph taken by a chap called Glumpler. His name stuck out to me. And we're going to see uh, what his photograph looked like and where it is and how Google Earth deals with that. So here I am in Google Earth. I'm going to uh, show you, work along Side me by all means, but I'm going to do, peak, do uh, Google Earth and you can do the Peak Visor one. So here is Mount Rushmore from above. And you can see we've got the car parky part and a museum -y bit and a viewing gallery. And here's Mount Rushmore. So lots and lots of people 
have taken photos. That's why they go. And each one of them is a lovely little photosphere. And most of them, I think, are going to be pointing in the same direction, don't you? So a lot of these photos look absolutely the same. But of course, each one is in a slightly different place. So if I just take my little street view man and plot myself down, oh, I've got a photograph. And it's a clever photograph because it panoramas. But it's not very easy to move around when I try to move around. And here is the photograph I chose for us to look at. Herr Glumpler's photograph. He came along and he went to Mount Rushmore. He went to the viewing part of it. He walked over to the side, to the right, left-hand side. And he took a photo. And here is his photo. Right, so we could see the faces. It looks pretty good. So this is looking pretty nice for, for Google. It looks like we know exactly where we are, exactly what we're doing. We've got this immersive experience as to what's going on. And really, I'm wondering what Peak Visor can add there. So let's try an exercise. Let's do Peak Visor next. I'll launch the poll and you can tell me where you get in Peak Visor, what you could see, what you think to Peak Visor. Uh, and we can try to compare the two. So open Peak Visor, explore the mountains. You can put the coordinates of Mount Rushmore in, but you can also just ask for the historical viewing terrace because uh, that's where, how it's stored in Peak Visor. And you've got the latitude and longitude to find, the compass bearing. Have a look and let us know what you can see. So let's see what Peak Visor is going to do for me. I know some of you are saying that you're not having um, great response times for Peak Visor. Uh, if it compares with mine as the same, then we can say that that's pretty much Peak Visor performs to the server. If it's different, then we can probably say that it might be something to do with um, different connection bandwidth. What did I say? Historical. Yeah, I think historical viewing platform isn't the same. So we'll try Terrace. No. So it's not working for me either. Let's try in here. No, I put those coordinates in somewhere. I think I put them in the chat, didn't I? So the 2D window responds very quickly because that's quite easy to do. The 3D window is very resource intensive. And the thing that you need to do if you think it's hanging a bit is just to refresh your browser. It could, of course, be that with a lot of us on the call, that is also putting extra stress on. Ah, historic viewing terrace. Thank you, Evelyn. Can you now see all uh, uh -huh. a poll? 
And did you fix it, co-host? I think you're a genius. Uh, Always have someone from Ballincap Tech team around. So yeah, you can see here, look, um, that it's trying. So I will give it a thwack on refresh and see if that helps. You also find that it goes dark uh, sometimes if you refresh. So whilst we're at it, let me show you how to switch the lights on. This little sun here shows you a window with some of the sun calc features. Date, time. This little slider here is the one that helps the most because it refreshes everything to the right time that you set it. We're not terribly worried one way or another. So here I am looking at Air Glimpler's photograph view. And the thing that hits me in the face and makes me very disappointed is that there's no faces. It would be really nice to see the faces. Why do you think, just stick it in the chat, why do you think we can't see the faces? Is there an obvious reason why we can't see the faces? And does it make you wonder why we can see them in Google Earth? <laughs> Data protection, I like it. <laughs> If this is from um, satellite imagery, then it's about 30 meter accurate. Therefore, you'd need a much higher resolution to scan those faces and get them into your data set. So that raises a, a different question uh, as to why we, not why we can't see it in peak visor, but, but why we can see it anywhere else. We're going to do a little test about changing the altitude, I think. Yeah, there is also um, a comment in the Q&A about a challenge of not being able to reducing to below 1.6 kilometer on Google Earth. So that's a topic that people are interested in. Really? Well, they can't get below a certain level. That's very interesting. Uh, some settings will throw you straight into, when you get below a certain level, it will throw you straight into ground level view, whether you want it or not. I've seen that happen. There are so many settings on Google Earth that it's quite frightening sometimes. Okay, now I'm looking down from above. I'm very high up. Here we are again. I'm still not seeing faces, obviously. That's Mount Rushmore. Here's our little viewing gallery. And I can be very precise about where I want to be, where Herr Glumpler was taking his photo. Okay, so Paul looks a little bit static now. One of those things that's great when it's working. So you should be seeing the results. So I'm thinking from what I've seen so far, um, Google Earth really wins the day on this. But Google Earth is something we should look at quite hard because Google Earth is trying to do what it thinks its, its users want. And that's admirable, but it's not always what we want in open source research. So Google's trying to keep everybody happy and to show them really, more than anything, what it's like to be um, in a certain place, to get the whole immersive feeling. But I'm panning up now, just looking around this model. I haven't done anything fancy. I'm seeing something very strange. So what I really did was just come very low. So I'm very interested that somebody else tried that as well. Um, when I come very low, the illusion that's being created here by Google is uh, revealed. We've got floating fir trees. 
and you can switch terrain view on and, and it'll have another go, but it's really not very easy to deal with. And we can't measure there and we are very likely to want to know exactly where we are. So this makes me feel differently now. This looks a bit Monty Python about, I mean, I'm seeing the ground under Mount Rushmore here. And I think it, it really proves the point. If I'm trying to do measures now, which is what the sorts of things we like to do in open source research, then it's, um, it's not always so easy. So the point really about that is to say, Google Earth does what it thinks its users want. And what it's done is stick the faces on in the sense that some other data has been blended. Now, that's much prettier than what we see on PeakVisor, but PeakVisor has realistic measures and we can still do a lot with it. It's not giving us that wonderful immersive feeling, but those faces aren't there on the LiDAR data either. They've been stuck on and there's a price for these fancy edges that we get uh, in the underlying data. So I really wanted to shake your faith, not in Google, but in any of these tools to be showing what God would see, shall we say. To, it's not necessarily there because you're being shown it. It's the best endeavors of the developers. So that's a, a different thing. Here's the immersive photo panorama that you get. Uh, this is the image you get if you go to ground level view next to Hair Glum Plus Photo, not on Hair Glum Plus Photo, just next to it. And if you think about that, if you remember Hair Glum Plus Photo, he was right over to the side of this auditorium. He was very, he was well past the left hand staircase. He was in the seating and he was well over to the left. And this picture that we've been given by Google as what you can see from Herr Glumpler's location, give or take you know, half an inch, is actually a generalization. We're very close to the left-hand staircase. We're behind the parapet, we're not in the seating. So the immersive Google Earth experience is designed to make you feel as though you've been there, but it comes at the price of geographic exactitude. So this isn't the view from where uh, Herr Glumpler was. This is just Google giving you a really good feel for what it'd be like to actually be there. And when you look closer, there is Herr Glumpler's location. He's almost by the far steps. We can't even see them from here. So I'm hoping I'm not I'm hoping I'm making you a bit mistrustful of what you're seeing. It's not accurate for geolocation, but that's because it wasn't designed to be. So peak visor, plain, old, ugly peak visor with no faces will actually show you where you are far more accurately and allow you to measure distances. It recalculates a new view every time you move Google Earth, when it's showing you those photos, doesn't. If you're within the area that Google Earth is going to show a particular photo, you'll get the same photo back. You can do accurate measures from above in Google Earth Pro, but not in the 3D ground level view. Peak visors is very unusual in providing measurement to any point in the 3D panorama. That's what's quite cool. And that picture should serve as a reminder to us all that Google Earth Pro wasn't built just for open source investigation. Whereas PeakVisor was.
So let's go and look carefully at the Peak Visor interface. Now let's actually start rolling the handbrake off, rolling down the road, uh, bare minimum, not going to get a driving license. Uh, if you've got two screens, do work along with me. What we're doing here is just exploding everything that's possible on this page and some um, reminders. It only does that if you did it in advance. That was just to show you that this is a driving lesson. So keep an eye on the URL because it changes and it's very helpful to watch the URL. It's a quick way of hacking into the guts of Peak Visor. You can edit it. I don't recommend it at the beginning, but you can. You can set your language, no surprises there. But also be careful because the Peak Visor landing page contains a lot of information about Peak Visor. It's not necessarily talking about our version. So you'll find that you'll get all sorts of interesting stuff and it might say, oh, such and such a feature is coming. Be careful, it might be coming on the um, smartphone version, not this one. And all we ever really do is uh, use the Explore Mountains button from here. Peak Visor's Explore Mountains page never looks like this. I have exploded all possible menus, but it's just to show you what's underneath these two buttons. You can change the GP coordinate, GPS coordinates. You can change some of the metrics. And best of all, you can change the silhouette color. Now, that doesn't seem like a big deal, but when you get to photo fit, it does because you want a good contrast between uh, your silhouettes and your photo. And you never know what color your photo is going to be. It's also useful when you're using uh, cross wires that you can switch on in Peak Visor for accuracy. But again, look here, the URL has changed. And now we have this long bit of gobbledygook, which is actually very interesting and very important. We're going to learn about because it totally specifies a particular view, not a particular location, an exact view. So I'm going to show you those tool button menus. And I'm going to change location maybe just by a degree and we can see what that looks like. So if you want to go back to the beginning, you just press Explorer. And Peak Visor is set to show you a particular, it's a bit like Google. It's the same for a while and it changes just a particular place. They've chosen Ben Nevis. So let's pan back here. We can see that Ben Nevis is in Scotland by the coast. It's under These numbers represent the number of peaks in a particular area. So if I go look to see where this is, remember it would have the URL with latitude and longitude in, but it stored Ben Nevis, so it just puts Ben Nevis. If I change this to 57 degrees, then this has moved very quickly from here up to here. So that's quite interesting. That's what one degree of latitude looks like. A change of one degree latitude looks like on the map. And we can try changing the color. You could do it here with the silhouettes. Notice that the compass changes as well. But you can also do it if you use um, the shift button and C. You can flick through all the colors that you're offered. This was the first thing I asked the Peak Visor developers to do because of our photo fits. And I asked them for red and they came back and gave us the rainbow. So I knew that maybe we had a project uh, that had some hope that they were prepared to do that work for us. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, thank you. So it's also location dependent. It's giving um, a lady in France Mont Blanc. So that's cool. Thanks for telling me that. I didn't know that. So I get Ben Nevis because I'm near Ben Nevis. If you get anything really interesting, tell us in the chat. Something very different depending on where you are. So 
map pin here, one of the big things about the map pin is if it's not spinning when you spin the 3D view, we've got a problem. It will, it's just a very good way of telling you that peak visors can't keep up anymore. But normally, if I start to move around, it automatically shows me where I'm pointing, which is good to know. And this, I don't know whether you can see brilliantly here, there is a little paler area, like a segment of the compass. Can you see that? And I can change its size by using mouse scroll wheel to go in and out. This is changing the focus. It is not moving. Beware, because mouse scroll wheel in at ground level view in Google Earth actually physically moves you. It changes your latitude and longitude. Look up at my URL now as I do this. That's the latitude. That's the longitude. This is the focus. Latitude and longitude, solid as a rock. Focus, changing. And this little segment here also shows you, are you really focused in? or not. So the zoom in and out can be done on both windows as you've seen. And you can have whichever window uh, maximized that makes the most sense for you. Be careful not to move your map pin outside of here because you might lose it. You need to keep your map pin in view. If you want to move it to bigger distance, scroll, um, zoom out. That's a lot easier way to do it. I can move by picking this up and taking it back home to Ben Nevis. And that's a big deal. Everything has to be recalculated. So it's caught up beautifully here, but this one hasn't changed. And you can tell it hasn't changed because you look at the coordinates up there. So I'll give it a kick through refresh. Whoa. Now we're where we should be. That's the view from Ben Nevis. Interested to know if you guys are um, having about the same performance I am or if things are a lot slower or faster. This is a reasonably high spec machine, but of course it's struggling on a Zoom call as well. So just let me know. So when we move, the URL changes and we can actually see what's gone on. We will also see it in the map too. But for the most part, um, the URL, you see it wait, it changes when the 3D view changes. So this whole URL up here is describing you almost like a scuba diver. You're somewhere in 3D space floating around because you don't have to be on the ground with peak visor. It will put you on the ground by default, but you can raise your altitude uh, if you want to. The convention seems to be that if you're talking about the height of land, you call it elevation. If you're talking about um, being in a drone or something, you'll call it altitude, but that's just a convention. So the nice news is you can hack into the URL and change things very directly. You don't need to know anything about it if you don't want to. You never need to use it. But if you're going to use Peak Visor in anger, you're probably going to want to because it's such a good quick hack uh, to change things quickly once you're used to it. So there's a very technical way to look at these parameters that are in the URL. I'm going to show you that first. I think it's very complicated and it's something that if you are a pilot or a gamer, you may find very simple. If it's not, don't worry, I'm going to show you the thing that I think is a bit easier. 
So this is what pilots and gamers understand. These different degrees of freedom for anybody in space. And if you're a gamer, maybe that's, that's completely obvious to you. But I need to think about it another way. So this idea of if you're learning to fly, you'll be taught pitch, roll, yaw as the angles that you can travel in. And you'll be taught your position as, as three degrees up, down, left, right. But I don't use virtual reality systems very much. I don't program them. So this is how I look at it. You're a deep sea diver. You've got three values of these seven that say where you are in space, latitude, longitude, altitude, or elevation. So that's three, just about position. Then there's which way your little helmet head is turning. Are you moving it up and down like you're nodding? Is that what your view is of where you are? Are you shaking your head? So you're rotating it horizontally? Or are you actually very clever and you can twist your head from side to side, which is a roll? So that's really three different directions of angling your head. And they correspond to these terms. Uh, pitch is up and down, nodding your head. Think of a ship pitching in the sea. Your is just your compass bearing. It's the horizontal rotation. So that's like shaking your head. And rotation or roll is when you're waggling your head from side to side, which isn't used very much in what we're doing for geolocation. And the final seventh parameter that you can use to change the view that you're looking at is horizontal field of view. And that compares to how wide the little glass window in your helmet is. So that's how I remember this stuff because I'm not uh, a gamer or a pilot. But those things entirely define every view, both in Peak Visor and in any other similar tool. So it's the same for Google. But Google doesn't let you hack into them in the same way. So looking at it another way, this is the hardest slide we have because we're looking at Peak Visor's interface. We're looking at the imaginary camera that's taken this picture. And we're also looking at the URL. So the URL is going to come in like a train because it's so hard to see. So we have the vertical rotation of the camera, the pitch. That's here. It's named. Minus six is very slightly looking downwards below level with the ground. So that makes sense. It looks like we're looking slightly downwards, doesn't it? Your is your compass bearing. That's your horizontal rotation as you swivel around on the level. So pitch, you can only really change by hacking the URL or grabbing the background and moving it up and down the way that we already have. Your, you can change by grabbing the background again. And you can read it off here, but you can't set it from there. Longitude and latitude are in the URL. They're where you are in space. And you can also set them here, as we've already done. Altitude is the height above the ground, usually. It's actually above sea level. And this is here in a little thermometer that allows you to move a thousand meters up. You may just have used it when you were out looking at uh, Mount Rushmore because that's the thing that in Peak Visor just changed your view quite accurately. And in Google made you see a giant hole under Mount Rushmore. So this is the exact way to play it. So altitude you can change. And finally, horizontal field of view. That's like the width of your helmet and it's how wide the view you're getting of your 3D, of your 360 degree panorama is. It's like it's proportional to the focus of your camera. It's actually inversely proportional to it. 
you see a wider field of view uh, if you're not so focused, if your focal length is shorter. So that's the hardest thing we have to contend with, keeping those in mind. But once you have them in mind, you will be able to handle any of these systems as they change, because you know that everything that's going on is actually about altering those. And those are the key to how we deal with uh, these systems to do geolocation. So let's do an exercise. Let's see how far we can get on intuition alone with Peak Visor. We haven't learned all the ins and outs of how to change everything. We've literally pretty much taken the car handbrake off and rolled down the hill. We know we can move around by picking up the 2D map pin and dropping it on the 2D map. We know that we can change our angle by grabbing the background and moving it around. So, okay, maybe that's enough. If you're trying to learn guitar, it's very easy to make quite a nice sound. If you want to be brilliant, it's incredibly hard to get any further. It's the opposite of the violin. But here, we're doing the equivalent of bumper cars or dodgems. Let's just see how far we can get because we want to come back to this when we've done our driving test and we've done some work this afternoon and see if it's worth doing the extra study to find out how to use peak visor properly. So we can watch a video, which is Sunset Over Ben Nevis. And I'm hoping this will show for you you could also watch it yourself if the URL goes into the chat. And we're going to stop at 50 seconds. But don't ignore this bit because it's giving you information. I would have preferred a continuous shot, not all this cutting. OK, that's the view that we are going to try to match in Peak Visor. So we then will be able to do a poll on this. I'm hoping that they're fixed. But what we're trying to do is to go into Peak Visor, go to Ben Nevis, and then move around just with a map pin, change the view, see how close you can get to reproducing this image. And of course, when you start to try this, first you think, I need these two images side by side, the peak visor one and the photo. And that's where we are right now. We haven't moved on to photo fit, but it starts to make you think, no, what I really need is one of them on top of the other. So we can actually see what's going on. So once you've got a good match, we want to know your latitude, your longitude. Those will be either in the URL or they'll be under the little map pin button. Your altitude, your compass bearing, that comes straight off your little compass. Let's have a look at how we go about doing this because we're effectively working with our, our hands behind our backs, aren't we? We can only move uh, in very unsophisticated ways. So I'm going to stick myself on the top of Ben Nevis. Refresh. It definitely doesn't want to go there. And now we get that fabulous, it reminds me of uh, Star Trek going into warp drive. You know, that amazing um, 
redraw of the silhouettes, but then it's so behind on actually coloring the terrain. Okay, so I'm looking around myself. I know what my picture looks like. I'm looking for a squiggly looking river. It's actually a lock. I can see something promising there. So I need to head in that direction. I'm gonna point at it. And I'm gonna to try to head over here. So I can see what's going on. Mm, it's hiding it from me. Why don't I try over here? See what that does. We get the marvelous Star Trek effect again. Maybe I'm not seeing over the top of this very well. Gonna go up here. Okay, that's more like it. Now I can see Squiggly River. But when I look, this should be slightly obscured, this part, by the rock. And the rock should actually not be up here. It should just go down a little bit. So then I guess maybe I go slightly backwards. And you can see that this is a very cumbersome process. It has promise. You are changing the view. But it's extremely time consuming. You can't do much different inside Google Earth Pro. The difference with Google Earth will be that it will um, be so smooth, you won't necessarily see, say, the details of anything that's particularly uh, changing very rapidly. But effectively, this is as much as we can do. And the question is, we can match two photos quite well if we faff about for long enough. Is it good enough? And I think probably the answer is no, it's not good enough because this view doesn't change very much if you move. We need something that will change really infinitesimally as soon as we make a very small movement because those small movements are what we need to change our position to guide us to a very accurate geolocation. So this is the best I could do when I spent time on it without using other features. So this is just going backwards and forwards between the image and the Google rendering. Now it's close and you could kid yourself and I've seen people kid themselves that this is anything other than an identification. It is an identification of this region for sure. It's not a geolocation in the sense of any accuracy. And that's why we would need to learn a bit more about PeakVisor before we can really use it as a geolocation tool. So this afternoon, we're gonna go straight to the keyboard controls, the driving controls and all the how-tos. So this is our proper driving lesson and our driving test is at the end. We have a couple of exercises where we go back to Ben Nevis and see what else we know. Now we've actually put some work in. And then uh, we look at photo fitting and also an exercise in, in British Columbia, which I quite like. It's quite an exciting one. And it really happened to me. So during this afternoon, we will send you this, although you already have it as a, you will have it in the slides. This is just where we are on the control summary. Someone was asking about this earlier. Thank you for asking. Uh, and this is, this is where we are. The biggest development that's taken place since we started the POPSI project to develop PeakVisor for open source research is that you can now move uh, whilst you're looking at the, the 3D window with shift and the arrow keys. You can imagine it's not as smooth or as speedy as Google is when you move around, 
but then you're moving around in a real life jacket environment, whereas in Google, you're moving around in something that's been polished to the point where we can't actually see the distinctive features we need sometimes. Um, we'll look at shifted C, L, and P, which are just nice things to help us drive better. They change the color and whether the labels are on and off. And they can put cross wires into the center of our screen if we're trying to be exact about things. So this is just something that you'll get for reference. Don't worry about it. It's one of my big display things. But actually, uh, all you need to do is think that you'll be able to refer to this when you have finished. So just recapping, this is what we learned about the seven parameters that define not just a peak visor view, but any, they call it a view shed sometimes. That's one of the terms that they use, not just a position, but an orientation in three dimensions and a definition of field of view. Those seven things, whether it's a video game, whether it's our geospatial information systems, they're what we're changing nearly all of the time. Everything we're doing, everything we're learning is about some combination of changing those. So let's look at how to drive Peak Visor. So I've, I've put it into seven tasks. Starting off inputting a new location, changing the altitude, reading things off, changing the viewing angles, adjusting field of view, which if you remember is the inverse of the focal length. So if you increase the focal length, you decrease the field of view. How to move from an existing location from one to another, hopping around inside that 3D world, which if you've seen is quite resource intensive, it's quite difficult to do. Peak visor takes a while to catch up. Um, I don't know what signs you have about peak visor performance, but my uh, fan speed increases enormously when I ask peak visor to do something difficult. How to measure distance. This is something that solves the depth problem for us in imagery and is very important to peak visor. And how to find a photo fit, which is what everybody knows about peak visor, what it's famous for. So all the different ways that we can input a new location. Let's divide them up into the ones where you do it approximately. That's what we just did. Drag and drop that map pin. You have no idea where you'll end up really, have you? Even at maximum magnification over here, it's a very approximate thing. Or you can enter a name in the Explorer input box. We've seen that was a bit um, of, a, of a game of dice as well. You can put Pete Visor in with something like Ben Nevis and it'll do fine, but other things have very strange names. One of them in Ukraine has, has the name Vidnamore, which I think is say no more. So there's all sorts of strange shortcuts, but in the end, we've got some approximate ways to get where we want to go. And then we've got the numerically exact ones. Hack into this URL, stick the coordinates in this search box, or open this little map pin and stick them in there. So plenty of ways to go where we want to go. Adjusting altitude. We can do it approximately, fairly approximate, it's not bad actually, with the altitude slider. The strange thing about the altitude slider is that it only lets you go a thousand meters upwards. So sometimes you have to hack into that thing here, which is the alt measure. Um, I'm going to run you a little video here where we go higher by changing the alt value, the altitude value. The best way to tell what's happening is to look at this little water pool here and see it shift around and change size. That's probably the best way to work out what's going on. One of the nice things about videos is I can say very clearly which buttons I'm pressing and what's going on. And we also highlight the mouse very well. This video also is on the PV for OSINV Twitter feed. So you don't say, we've seen that a lot. We definitely need to browse a refresh sometimes. But look, 
that little pond has moved inwards and it got smaller. So that kind of tells us that we, we got higher. So that was done by changing the altitude. I'll do it now myself by using the slider. Here we go, exploring mountains. Look at Ben Nevis. Check your view, pick something as a reference. When I grab this, it's very like um, the slider that's also in Google. I grab it, it shows me current altitude and I can pull it up to, you can already see peak visor start to redraw some of the silhouettes. It's quite nice to watch that, you see the effect. So I'm going to go right up here, much, much higher. And then Peak Visor will try to recolor everything. It's got the silhouettes already. Give it a kick. And I know that it's changed it because I can read off Alt up here. Look, it has changed it. Two, three, four, five. We weren't there before. Yep, I can see that I'm higher up. That gives me a totally different vantage point. So the dreadful thought is that not only do we geolocate ourselves in terms of latitude and longitude, we also geolocate ourselves in terms of altitude. The view has changed. That gives us one more degree of freedom to worry about when we're trying to get things right. And there's our familiar view as before. And you can see that maybe that loaf of rock that was in the way might be this one because it curves. Do you remember how it was annoying that it it curved downwards towards the right of the picture. So maybe we're down there. Interesting. So that's two ways of changing altitude. You can hack in or you can just use the slider. What about reading the viewing angle? The viewing angle horizontally is your, it's the one that we see in the compass. The one that's you nodding your head up and down is pitch, like a ship pitching in the sea. Approximately, we just drag and drop it. If we want to do it numerically, we have to do it through uh, the URL. Let's just watch those things change together. When this doesn't work, it's because peak visor is struggling. It's one of the first signs. So you can see the map pins turning because we're turning in the 3D view with drag and drop. And you can see that the compass is also keeping pace. So that makes sense. Now, let me show you. I'll do it where um, I'm going to just bang in new values through um, the URL. So here we are looking out at our normal view that we saw before of this lock with the kinky little bit sticking out with the village on it and the little islands that look like water lily leaves, and I'm going to change the yaw. What are you expecting to happen if I change the yaw? You're expecting it to rotate? That would be good. So that was, was that 10 degrees rotation I just did? So you can tell it's moved, but Let's try this. It's only horizontal rotation. We know it's got the gist because the map pin has moved, as has the URL value for your. OK, now you can see we're peering up this other bit of lock. We've come from around there. Same with pitch. At the moment, we are pitch look minus 16 because we're looking downwards. If I move that to minus 26, what are you expecting to happen? Minus 26. What will we be seeing? The sky or the soil? Minus 26 is downwards. Yep. So. If you ever find yourself with a really weird looking view on Peak Visor, 
there is always the possibility that in fact, um, you're staring either into the sky or into the ground. Um, so just check that your, your and pitch values are sensible. That could be why you're seeing what you're seeing. And remember pitch, you can only see it in one place. You see it in the URL, it's not displayed anywhere else. Note also that the compass doesn't just tell us our orientation in the middle. It tells us not as a number, just as uh, this, the size of this light segment, what our horizontal field of view is. So if it's a wide horizontal field of view, we're seeing a bigger proportion of the 360 degree panorama. We're packing a lot of detail into our little window. If we see that very small, then it's the equivalent of a telephoto zoom, where your focal length would be increasing, but your field of view decreases. So a very narrow viewing angle means that you've got the equivalent of a telephoto lens as though you were you know, doing amazing wildlife shots or something like that. So this tells us two things. Let's just think what it really means to change field of view. It's important to us because it's crucial to us doing photo fitting. And that's what really gives us accurate geolocation. So let's just be sure we understand what, what field of view is. This is us standing in the middle as geolocators, and we can spin round 360 degrees in a panorama. We've done it, it was quite fun. Peak Visor performs quite well when you do that because it's already prepared the whole panorama usually. So we're standing there and the question is, how, what proportion of that 360 degrees is gonna be packed into our picture that we see on our computer screen? You can blow it up, you can make it smaller, but the edges, what's included and excluded at these edges from what we see. So let's look at another way of doing this, which is to think about it in terms of the field of view angle. On the left, we're seeing what would happen if a camera was taking this view on the right. So you'll see the actual focal length of the camera changing. The person is zooming in. Over here, you'll see the photograph that would have been taken. So just watch it for a bit. The viewing angle's going down. We're seeing a very focused view, viewing angle goes up. We're seeing a less focused view, but more of it, okay? So big viewing angle means you see lots of detail from around the size. It's almost like your peripheral vision has been included, big viewing angle, but that means small focal length. So you're not getting fantastic focus you're not getting fantastic detail, but you are seeing a lot. It's obvious there would be a trade-off, isn't there? When you want fantastic detail at a distance, you need to sacrifice your field of view. So just one more time, watch the lens, what it's doing. It's moving inversely with the field of view angle. We can almost taste that bloke's coffee by the time we finish, we know what specs he's wearing. And then we go back out and we can see everything. So what's happening? Is the photographer moving? Is the field of view decreasing then increasing? I'll just play it again, in case you don't remember which order it went in. What's happening? And it highlights something that's very deceptive for us as people who only get the end result of this whole process. We're just getting the photos. We can't really understand depth in them. What's actually going on? And the important thing to know is that the photographer's not moving at all. It's an easy thing to assume. If someone just showed you the video and it was smooth, probably if they weren't going up to the top of a balcony, if it was just on the ground, there would be no difference. Your brain wouldn't be able to tell whether 
the the person was moving or anything else, just watching it. But the photographer isn't moving. They're standing there and they are changing the focal length of their camera. They are zooming in. Their field of view gets smaller. They can see everything, but at a price. And then their field of view gets larger again. They can see loads of stuff, but not with great focus. It's a quite a difficult concept to grab. So I'm very pleased a lot of people did it and that they know that both of those second two statements are true. Don't worry if you thought they, the camera was moving. Just take it as, isn't that strange? Actually, you can achieve the same effect by changing the field of view. So that one's uh, a very useful exercise because we're going to need to understand field of view for us to fit photos. How do you adjust field of view in Peak Visor? You have two ways. You can use the mouse scroll wheel or you can stick the value in. And the values are between four and 90. Oh, whoops, sorry. Four and 90. Why did that do that? Because I didn't hit the right bit of this video. That's why. Okay, watching that little segment go smaller, then larger. The minus 90 value is just the your value. It's got nothing to do with horizontal field of view. So we don't get a number except in the URL. But that's how it works. If I now show you me doing that on Peak Visor, that will reinforce how it's done. But probably you're doing this very naturally anyway because it's, it's so intuitive. Right, watch latitude and longitude now. Here I am, scrolling to 90 degrees field of view. Whoa, it's like zooming in, isn't it? If I was taking a picture of a field mouse, this is what I'd be doing. I'd go right up to four. We're looking at the pixels now. This is really important because particularly because this doesn't do the same thing using the mouse scroll wheel in Google, and that's what most people have learned. I know that when I started, I wasn't fully aware that I wasn't moving when I did that. It looked like I might be getting closer and it looked better. You need to be able to adjust this for photo fitting, but you also be able to need to know whatever you do to this is not helping your geolocation as such. It's not changing your position. Geolocation is about knowing that you've got a great fit and what your position is. So field of view needs to be adjusted to get a good photo fit, but that's not all you need to do. You then need to move yourself around to get the perfect fit. So this is a, a confusing uh, setup. And of course we can just go. So let's hope we can keep the hang of field of view because it's an important one. How to move from an existing location. You can do it approximately. And as you've seen, it's actually very compute intensive to move using most of these are compute intensive because Peak Visor has to recalculate everything. But dragging and dropping in a map pin window, not very exact, even if you move this to the best possible scale. But you can do it using the teleport function, which I'll show you. You can do it using the shift and arrow keys, which is a very incremental way of moving. All of these, remember, will be in your uh, summary sheet. And you can just enter new coordinates. Oh, thank God, that's really simple. So let's see what this one's doing. It's one of those Alps, isn't it? Definitely one of those Alps. Looking round, down from the top of a mountain. This is what it feels like if you've conquered the Matterhorn. And there are a few, not glaciers, they're actually lakes. Well, little coals or pools or something. Right, I press shift. I'm hitting left mouse click. And lo and behold, a little window comes up with, do you want to teleport there? Yes. 
So we are trading places. Anywhere you can point to in the 3D panorama, you are trading places with. It will take you there and show you what it looks like from there. So we seem to have quite a green, blue looking. Oh, nice. So we're pulling ourselves like a little golem creature out of the lake and panning round and there's the Matterhorn. So we just came from the top of there. And the reason we chose the lake was it's very obvious when you've got it right, you're suddenly in blue. That's powerful. Don't expect it to um, not need a little help a lot of the time. That's me now moving the map in, the approximate way of doing things, back onto the top of the Matterhorn. Pow, we get the going into deep space effect. And it's trying to redraw what it looks like from the top of the Matterhorn. You can do this in Google, but you need to do it from the 2D view. And the difficulty is there's lots of things you can't recognize from the 2D view that you can recognize in the 3D view. So this is the huge value to um, anybody who's doing this uh, in open source research. It genuinely is a great advantage. So let me see. I will try. You've seen teleport. You've seen mouse drag and drop. Let's look down. Oh, there's a little ridge to walk along. So we can probably use these as good reference points. I am pressing shift and the arrow keys. And you can see that something's happening. How come? It's going crazy in the URL and it's starting to redraw the silhouettes. It's having a problem, but it's managing it. So we are actually moving there. I'll try to give it a little help with a refresh kick. And of course, as time goes on, we will get a dark sky because it's dark in over Ben Nevis. But we're moving very slowly, very incrementally. This is the fine adjustment stuff to moving peak visor. It performs better if we don't have a zoom call on the go. But this works in photo fit. So when you're trying to get the perfect photo fit, you can use these keys. They're for fine adjustment only but they're the things that really give you accuracy. And I think this little thing that we're following is actually uh, a little trail that we could walk down. But this is one of the developments that's really valuable. It's not something that you use really outside of photo fit, but it is something that makes an enormous difference to what we can achieve in terms of accuracy. And when people wonder why accuracy matters, just think of the accuracy of a photograph of a missile landing near a national border. Do 10 meters matter? They probably matter a great deal. Some of Bellingcat's most amazing work was around uh, where the missile was fired that brought down MH17. Accuracy really matters and it can come down to a few meters. So peak visor contributes to accuracy. It's not, it's not a thing to, to look at lightly at all. So how to measure distance? This is a beautiful one. Shift and left mouse. And if you point at anything you like the look of, it can tell you how far away it is in the 3D view. In Google, you'd have to go back above, hit one, hit the other. Make sure you've got it accurate, and then it would allow you to use the ruler. This is from the side on. And this is quite impressive because this is dealing with depth in an image. And that's the thing human brains can't work out very well. So maybe you think you're in such and such a place. One of the quickest, dirtiest ways is to point at something you do recognize and go, how far away is that? And Peak Visor will just tell you, no messing. Shift and left mouse. This ends the difficulty of depth perception that we have in images where there is very little reference point. 
So that whole idea that we can't tell whether it's small or far away, large or close by, this is a very nice tool to help with that. Right, back to Ben Nevis. Now we've done some driving lessons. Now we've passed our test. We should be able to find out far more about what's going on here. So we've only been joyriding here really before. So if we give you the coordinates of a good visual match, then we're going to ask you a whole load of other stuff that we didn't have before. So if you go open peak visor, goes to those coordinates, what can you see? Right, let me put in those coordinates. We're not far off here. But when it comes to matching images, we have to be absolutely exact. If we didn't, Peak Visor wouldn't be an accurate geolocation tool. The tech team were also laughing at me for having inordinate numbers of uh, figures after the point uh, when I'm copying and pasting locations. Of course, more than about six figures uh, isn't, isn't very helpful. It just makes life harder for you. We aren't that accurate. So teleporting to that location. See if I get what you get. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Wow, this is odd. What, what am I seeing? I'm at the right latitude and longitude, but I'm just seeing rock. If, if I look around here, I'm OK, but I'm not seeing any of the things I want to measure. So what's happening to me? Mm -hmm. Let me try changing my altitude because remember, I'm a drone. And I think I'm stuck behind some sort of rock face. So my latitude and longitude are the same. Oh, there's the sun, that's nice. And a sun trail, always good. Oh, look. I have appeared over the top of that rather annoying looking loaf of bread rock. Does this now start to look familiar to you? That we only changed altitude by, oh, what would you say? 300 meters? And look what's happened. So I can't see the village yet. I can see that thing in the distance we want to measure but I can't see the village yet, so I probably need to go a little higher. Can you see why? This is in the foreground. It's in the way. It's blocking my view. It's also giving me a very exact way of checking my altitude against what I can see. This view is going to change enormously with very small changes in my altitude. That's a great thing. It's like a lever for me to be exact about where I am. So what should we say, 1250, 1255? Let's see what else I can see. I want that village to come into view. It's a little sort of pale thing on the peninsula. Mm, not quite, nope, still not seeing it. I don't need to hang around here. Uh, I'll just change it again. Okay, that's not looking too bad. Which of these, by the way, do you think is the loaf of bread rock that's in our way when we saw that original video? Interesting question. So, how far away are we? What was our next query? What could you see of the landscape? Well, I couldn't see anything to start with. Why was I seeing it? Because... As we said earlier, peak visor by default puts you on the ground. If you give it coordinates, it will go away, look at its digital elevation model, find where ground level is and stick you on it. And that's what it did to us just then. We had to change altitude because we're the drone. It didn't know. 
So I was seeing it because I was too low. The clue in question four was what's your altitude? It was about 900 and something. Now it's 1300 and something. I can see everything. How far away is the highest point on the skyline? Mm -hmm. I'm going to change my horizontal field of view with the mouse scroll wheel to have a jolly good look at what it is on the skyline. And now I'm going to use Shift and L to switch those labels off because at the moment they can be very useful, but right now they're just in the way. So how far away is the highest point on the skyline above the end of the lock where that red cross was? Shift, click, oh. So it's just grabbed something in the distance. I had no clue what that was. It's off the coast of Scotland, did you know? So it's actually off the coast of Scotland. It's an island. Ooh. It's actually one of the Hebrides. They turn up in the shipping forecast sometimes. So because we did our homework, we actually now know that that funny little scroggly thing in the distance is a separate island, that that must be the sea. It's the Hebridean Sea, but it actually turns into the Atlantic. Um, and that it's, we're seeing 80 kilometers away. Wow. Notice, by the way, that horizontal field of view tends to default to 60. The reason it tends to default to 60 is that that's the normal kind of field of view of an average camera. So a telephoto lens would probably be about four degrees. And I haven't used many photographs in open source imagery that were four degrees, but I have used videos where the person zoomed me through the shot. So that's why I'm so cautious when I try to put lots of different still frames from a video together. They actually may not fit. Uh, 90 degrees is a huge wide angle. And 90 degrees is um, something like a fisheye lens. And those I have worked with uh, in, in at least two cases. One was uh, working on driftbacks with the images from the Turkish Coast Guard of people being taken from boats to, I hope, safety. And the Turkish Coast Guard wanted to record everything that was going on, and therefore they used fisheye lens cameras. Also in Ukraine, some of the footage we've used um, was of building security cameras. They both have really quite um, wide fields of view for very obvious reasons. The security camera wants to cover everything it can. So 60 is a reasonable setting because that's what uh, your average smartphone will do. So the other thing we want to do, having found out that this remote place is actually 70 something kilometers off the coast, here's our little village using the mouse scroll wheel to zoom in, changing my horizontal field of view, making it smaller and smaller so I can zoom in on there. Shift, hit what I think is the middle of that village. Pow, it's actually nine kilometers away. And especially when you do this uh, decreased field of view and zoom in, you really lose the sense of proportion on that. It also, by the way, gives you all the details of this location before it teleports you there. Eight kilometers, eight meters elevation, nine kilometers away, and these are its coordinates. So if you ever want a playground in 3D to hop around, it may be slow, it may be all sorts of things. It's very accurate. We actually know so much more now about what we were seeing in this image. That little uh, place in the background is, if you find it on another map, it's called Rum Island. And it's got some, it's famous for having this particular kind of protected species of bird out there. So that was, that was quite a, a strange one, wasn't it? Because we weren't quite sure uh, where we were to start with. 
this is a picture of the crater we were in. I don't know if you recognize it just from just from the shape inside Peak Visor. It, it had a sort of pointy bit, which I think is the peak of Ben Nevis. And we were down here as a little grown drone. We'd been put on the ground. And funnily enough, Ben Nevis is orientated such that the highest bit of this crater is the one that points in the direction we were looking. So peak visor without an altitude value will put you at ground level. And you may not want to be at ground level. If you're being very exact, even if you're a person, if you're looking over the top of something close to you, whether you're a child or a huge grown up will make the difference in what you can see. So not to be sneezed at. Um, so there we are, and we are staring at the wall. And it was very shocking. You, you get used to it. Sometimes peak visor will show you something you're not expecting. And a lot of the time, you just need to wait for it to reload. But also a lot of the time, it's showing you something unexpected because there's a very good reason. And it's showing you what's genuinely the view from that particular view shed. So we were staring at the wall. And then we got our heads of the parapet by changing one value, by changing altitude. And suddenly, we can see for miles. That's a very extreme example of the fact that small changes in our parameters can have massive changes in the 3D view. So if you imagine this thing, not right down here, if you imagine it just a few meters lower, you would not be able to see any of the things we just measured. And we need to leverage all the time those um, those features. And there, just to show you, is the compass angled so that we can see it almost so it was on the ground. It's west over there. Remember when we were looking out towards the, the coast? It was west, wasn't it? It was to the Hebridean Sea and then it was to the Atlantic. So yes, our viewpoint is blocked west and that makes sense from the map. So remember when we talked about lines of sight, our example was about a person in one place checking lines of sight to two objects. But actually what just happened to us in practice was we were in two places checking out whether there's a line of sight from either one of them to a fixed object. And we could see what was going on the whole time because we had the 2D and the 3D together in view at the same time. And we could check the whole time what we were changing because although it's a bit crude and ugly, we can see the values in Site Peak Visor. They're there for everybody to see. They're sitting in the URL. So Peak Visor defaulted to the ground. Ben Nevis's summit, by the way, we know is 1345. So if you were guessing now what height to do, I, I don't know if any of you did this, the ones that escaped the crater, you ground level was nine, five, six meters above sea level. How would you have thought about the value to put in for altitude to have a hope of seeing something? Well, you could go to the 2D map. You could see that Ben Nevis was 1345 meters high, but you probably don't need to be as high as that because that's the peak. And we're looking west, aren't we? So the thing that's most likely to be in the way is looking at the contour lines. I told you they come in useful. That's 7, 11 meters. That's not too bad. 12, 10 meters here. That's probably the place you'd start and think, well, I need to see over the top of that. And I need a bit of an angle. So you would reasonably have started at something like 1250 and then kept going. But these small changes that give variations in view, those are the things that make us accurate. And gradually, first of all, we could see all the way over here, couldn't we, right to the, the end. We couldn't see the village on the peninsula to start with. We could only see into the background until we went higher. And then gradually as we rose, we began to see things closer and closer. So this is an important point because it's about the interplay of foreground objects in your open source image 
and background objects. The foreground objects are a really valuable lever for you to be accurate about where you are because here's a person. This is us when we were uh, slightly lower. Here's a person who's, and that's what they can see. They can't see the blue ones. That's below their vision, the edge of their vision. They can see the, the red mountains and they can see them over the top of this yellow rock, but they can't see any of this other stuff. Step forward a little bit, and you can see a little bit more, but you still, so this person can see the red mountains, the blue, whatever they are, but can't see the yellow ones, still blocked. You see how what these people see in the 3D view actually informs us about where they are. That's not a big step they've just taken. Those would be changes in latitude and longitude to make that change, because this is all on a straight line. The principle that we applied was the one about height. So same problem, but one drone at one height, the lower down one can only see this. The one that goes a bit higher up, suddenly these blue mountains come into view. So this is the principle on which um, Peak Visor is based to let you find out what's going on. And whenever you see an image, if you have a selection of images uh, where you're looking to do geolocation, something that has what look like close foreground objects and distant background objects can be a very useful thing uh, to apply Peak Visor to. And it's the same principle when it comes to photo fit. The Matterhorn is a particularly wonderful subject for photo fit because it's a totally irregular shape. So you can make a tiny movement, particularly around the Matterhorn, as though you were dry, you know, dancing around the Maypole, and its shape changes. It sure as hell is not a pyramid. It's this really wonky thing. And it's fantastic for practice, if you're that sad, uh, for doing geolocation. Everyone's taking a picture of the Matterhorn from all these different angles. So when we watch somebody do this, they are attempting to change all of those values. And remember, when you're here, you'll probably use shift and the arrow keys to move yourself around to give yourself a more accurate location. So is that good enough? It's not bad, but when you look at it, I'll just try to stop it at the right point. I'll try to stop it at the end. I didn't manage it, dash. Let me see if I can move it along. This is the only disadvantage, of course, of using videos. Can I stop it? Right, so say, I think we get better. Is that good enough? Well, probably still not. And I'll show you the best one I found and let you play with it. But what we do with Peak Visor is take your match image, always check it for EXIF data. It's embarrassing. Um, if there is any, of course, you don't need it or you can check it, but you don't need to do any geolocation. I'm assuming that most of the things we ever deal with don't have it, but it, I forget to check and we really should check. There are browser add-ins that do it to see if actually the camera's recorded the location. Um, even if the camera says something, it makes sense to check it. I have gone looking for test data on the internet and asked people for it. Is there any photo you've taken of something that's an interesting piece of terrain where you know exactly where you were standing? Can you give me the coordinates? And so many of the websites that say they can, actually, when you check it in Peak Visor, quite a few of them aren't accurate. So you can't believe it any more than you can believe where a Google Earth photosphere is with any precision. So um, always worth a go. Then you hit the camera icon and upload your match image. Confirm the current coordinates in any screens. So it will say to you, you've probably
got as close as you can in peak visor in the 3D rendered image with all these different things you change. You think this looks like my image. Now I'm going to photo fit. And peak visor annoyingly asks you to check everything and says, are these really the coordinates you want? And the answer is yes. Then you'll probably change the color for contrast of the silhouette. Red's often good, but not always. Peak visor will give you handles to change positioning and rotation. It's the only time you get to change rotation, by the way. And then you can change horizontal field of view, but only if you need to. And you'll use shift plus and minus to get the right geolocation, latitude and longitude coordinates. And the reason that I've spent cumulatively months uh, doing peak visor geolocations is that it's not a simple business. If you're a perfectionist, you always want it to be better. But um, it's very rewarding when you find somewhere, if you find a location in a place where there's no photography to help you, um, no obvious other ways of finding something other than using rendered geospatial data. So if you ever are satisfied, it lets you take it home and frame it. So this is what it will look like. You'll have got your peak visor 3D rendered image as close as you can. And you think, right, I'm going to go for it. I'm going to hit import photo. You select your photo. We're going to give you a picture of the Matterhorn in a minute for you to use. Uh, we put the photos in the chat. You can also, of course, screen grab them from this screen. So you'll upload your photo. I think someone was asking before whether this was possible. Yes, it is. Then it goes through, and this changes all the time, but it goes through some sort of uh, thing that makes me impatient where you have to confirm your coordinates and all that stuff. And then eventually you end up at the place where you're trying to do your geolocation and you will get a readout notice you don't have a readout in the url which i find a bit disappointing so they've put it over here azimuth angle is your pitch field of view and your location coordinates so the only thing you don't have is altitude um, which i think needs to be changed so i will simply ask the developers which is a nice feeling in life that you just have to ask the developers so here are the controls, on-screen handles. Here they are, look. You can change the rotation. You can move it around. Drag and drop, you can pick up the whole thing and move it around. Mouse wheel for horizontal field of view. You've seen what that does. It makes it um, grow and shrink. By the way, that's not a graphical zoom function. A graphical zoom function simply magnifies linearly this shape. If you put it into paint and you magnified it, you would not get the same result as you do by changing the horizontal field of view. It's not a simple zoom. It's a non-linear calculation. That means that the shape doesn't change just by magnification. It takes into account the depth in this image. It is much more magical than that for want of a better way of putting it. So you're going to use shift and the um, plus and minus keys if you want to change field of view very accurately. And if you want to change the location very accurately, you're going to use those arrows. And for comfort, you change the color and the labels. So this is a pretty good photo fit of the Matterhorn. And given that we don't have all afternoon, what I thought we would do is to give you those coordinates and let you have a go at reproducing that photo fit. Get a feel for how the commands you've learned change that photo fit and how uh, exact or inexact you can be. Okay. So you probably found it's um, something you need to practice.
if you want to look at all of the values that are reproduced here, I found it best at 2881 as an altitude. But altitude is always the missing link in the sense that that can be the one thing that uh, you haven't thought of, that in fact the photograph wasn't taken at ground level. And if you see a, a drone video, then that gives you a clue. But the rest of the time, we tend to assume that these things are taken at ground level. And that may be an assumption that, um, that you need to challenge sometimes. So moving on to our driving test exercise, we are going to British Columbia. This is a real exercise which uh, happened as part of my tech fellowship that somebody asked me to check something with PeakVisor. And it, what happened actually demonstrates the answer. So I was asked to confirm a geolocation. So I was sent it all, um, given it on a plate, really. This was the estimate. So this is a piece of water in, this is taken from Peak Visor again. So yes, water's blue. Um, this is called the Morse Basin. And it's a stretch of water where the person had done the geolocation who didn't use Peak Visor thought it might be here in this place at 54, all of these. Notice I've curtailed it to about six or seven points. And they sent these three images. Now, when you look at those, they look as though they might splice together. But we always have to say to ourselves, were they taken in the same place? Were they taken by the same camera? Was it using the same focal length or horizontal field of view? Always question it. You can get things really wrong with Peak Visor if you make assumptions that you can't justify. And that's true for the whole of open source investigation. And Arik Toller, who is a great hero of Bellingcat and open source investigation until recently was head of training and research, he made me feel really bad by saying, there's an awful lot of bad geolocation and uh, you should understand what you're doing before you try geolocation. I've always been very frightened of bad geolocation that in some way I could even cause it to be published in Bellingcat's name, which would damage Bellingcat. That's not very likely because Bellingcat checks everything it uh, publishes. But nevertheless, we have to be very careful what we're doing. Uh, when we put this stuff out there, there are plenty of proofs of all sorts of things which suffer from confirmation bias, technical confirmation bias, not just somebody's politics or beliefs. So the old Bellingcat idea that everything has to be reproducible by somebody else is a really good test to apply to anything you ever publish, wherever you publish it, if it's just a, a tweet. Um, so we can't automatically splice those together. We can do it as long as we know that uh, it isn't particularly valid necessarily. So all we're doing is checking, is that where this chap thinks it is or not? Well, that should be simple, shouldn't it? And we can use PeakVisor to do this. I want you to use only PeakVisor because this is an example of a problem where, say we don't have any street view photography, say we don't have any photographs that are going to help us because there's an awful lot of terrains where that's true in the world. Let's just use peak visor, take those coordinates, and we want to know, are we even in the right place? Yeah, is, that, is that vaguely the right place? Okay, fair enough. But now, is that exactly the right place as far as we can be exact? So the next thing we're going to do is look at mountains, any of them named by Peak Visor in the photos. What are they? The lines of sight match up. Uh, this test geolocation, is it totally consistent with what we're seeing in the photographs, given now that we can test lines of sight in Peak Visor? Is the shoreline correct? Can we get photo fits of those um, three photos from the test location. And is there anything we can do to get this more accurate? 
occasionally you need to resize the images to get a good peak visor fit. And that's when changing horizontal field of view just won't stretch far enough. We are trying to improve this geolocation we've been given. It's a guess from someone who's extremely good at open source research and doesn't use peak visors yet. So just using Google Earth from above, it's a very sensible guess. But you can probably work out that I've created this exercise because I think we can do better. That's a very good point, anonymous attendee. Um, people do regularly flip photos. Normally, I think it would be, no, it's a very good point. When you're doing reverse image search, you certainly want to try flipping things to see what goes on. If it's just been moved in terms of rotation, you can deal with that very easily in the photo fit. But outside of that, if, if someone had just flipped these and said to me, where's this? I think I'd have had a real problem. So I'm going to give you a few minutes to work through the questions. It's probably not too difficult to say that whether or not you think this is vaguely the right area. Are we in the right lake? You can use peak visors labels where it names mountains to answer the second question. And you're going to use the 2D window for lines of sight, I'm guessing. Then you're going to go to photo fit with our three images I just sent you. And then we're going to really do something creative and try to work out a more accurate geolocation. No, Peak Visor doesn't let you load all the images at once. Sorry, should have said that. One at a time, because you're always trying to match uh, a different part of the, the view anyway. But you're right. In this case, you could probably just change the your value to move from image to image. And it, it looks like a really quick fix to just splice them together as we have here and try to photo fit that. But believe me, that would be bad practice. Do not do this. Fit them separately. Then if they fit separately, you can splice them together and see if that works. But you need the proof first and you mustn't ever show anything that you don't think is at the best possible realistic degree of focus. Remember, it's possible to fit a straight line with peak visor. If you fit a straight line, you haven't done much because whenever you look at one of these, you have to think, is this a good fit? But then you also think, could I fit this to another image? Is it actually such a simple silhouette that it would fit lots of places? Uh, and if the answer is yes, that's not very helpful. It has to be characteristic enough for us to have faith in it. And so the person who was asking me about very flat places has made a good point. If it's flat enough, it's not going to be anywhere near as helpful. If there's anything distinctive, we have a very good chance of being accurate. Have a think about which bits of peak visor you're using when you do this. The test geolocation looks completely feasible. We can see just in the corner Mount Stewart. So we should be able to pick that up. It's quite convincing. It looks original enough. Uh, it's not just a flat landscape for us to think that we probably are in the right place. And in particular, if we do a few distance measures from things we can see in the panorama, that's probably going to make us think that's a yes for are we in the right place? I'm just going to read a couple of questions. Is there a map view in the photo fruit view? No, there isn't, anonymous attendee, and I, I know what you mean. Um, I think actually that the Popsy project is going to do quite a lot of development on photo fit because it's not totally understood, I think, what, what we need. You don't need to load any images into Peak Visor to answer question one. 
you just look around and think, does this match with the photos enough for me to think we're in the right place? And you could say, I can't tell. That would be perfectly reasonable. It's from looking at the panorama. The questions that you're answering um, for the for low, lower down, those are the ones where you need to do the photo fits. If you press shift and L, the labels toggle on and off. So if you're not seeing any labels anywhere, you may need to switch them on for some reason. So yeah, it does look like it's on the same lakes. Uh, I'm seeing Mount Stewart. Well, I've got there, that's good. Okay, so I'm getting um, labels here. If I press Shift and P, <laughs> if I'm pressing Shift and L, silly me, they disappear. If I press Shift and L again, L for label, I should remember that, shouldn't I? Uh, I'm seeing those go on and off. Now, if you're not seeing those, I'm very interested. If nothing you can do gets those back on, then please let me know your configuration of browser um, because and and operating system because that's that's interesting. So all I've done to answer the first questions is is just look around. I found the name of the mountains and I'm just refreshing here. I was waiting for it to go dark. So remember how we stop it going dark if we don't like it being dark. We go down here and we switch the lights on. Okay. So is the are the lines of sight sensible? Well, That's what that mountain looks like on here. By the way, it's a good idea to dismiss these little things when they pop up, otherwise they seem to cause problems. I'm going to point at Mount Stewart and see about that. All right. And the headland. That's not the headland, that's interesting. I'm not oh, that's just about hitting the headland. But in my images, the headland comes right in front of Mount Stewart. So that's my first feeling of doubt that I'm in exactly the right place. So the next question is about the shoreline and the photo fits. Right. So. This was my photo fit on image one at that location, at the test location. It's not good enough. This is all completely wrong up here. That's not a fit. We know that if you change your viewpoint, all of this will shift. So we're not uh, happy with that at all. This line, sometimes uh, these can be deceptive in that what we see is the trees. The level of the earth uh, is lower down. So sometimes that can be a reason if the trees are sparse. But on the whole, that's just not good enough. So that makes me very worried. So we move on to the next one. Oh, dear. This is actually the worst one of the photo fits. This one's really poor. So that says to me, and obviously I try um, moving these to angle it, but basically it either fits this side or it fits this side. That's making me think we're really not in the right place. Remember these labels are actually there on the silhouette. They're not on the photograph. The labels come from the silhouette. When you think about it, that's obvious, but I sometimes get confused at what I'm looking at. So this is a, a very bad photo fit. Uh, and I'm now saying we're, this isn't the right place might be the right lake or whatever it's called, but it's not the right place. This one, no, that's not very good either. I suppose I would, yeah, this this fit here. Uh, with the trees, I'm a little bit, I give it a bit more latitude, but when I look at the shape of Mount Stewart, 
this just looks plain wrong. So even if we shrank the image a bit, we're still not going to get uh, something that, that doesn't work. So we need to look harder. We're, we're kind of in the right place. So we need to look very hard at what we can actually see here. Right, first and foremost, when you look at the photo, the shoreline is wiggling about here. I've just drawn an orange line on it, but the shoreline's wiggling around. That's a good reference point. That's the top of, of this little peak, um, which we can find on the 2D map. It only gives its height, but it's very obvious which one it is. That's fine. My arrow is not quite in the right place. It should be moved along. But basically, we're, we pretty much have got a straight shoreline wiggling around this straight line up to the top of that peak. But when I look at my rendered image, I haven't got any shoreline at all. And the peak's not in the right place. So something's saying to me, that initial location, it should be looking along a shoreline when it's pointing at that mountaintop. And it isn't. So I need somewhere that is pointing along a left-hand shoreline in pretty much a straight line at that particular peak. And these two bumps, well, they're very far apart in the 3D rendered view, but they're quite close together in the image. So again, these two things, we can see them here, we can point at them. They should look quite close together. So wherever you are, they should be in a bit of a, you know, more or less a straight line. They're not on top of one another, but they're close. They shouldn't be at some angle that looks miles apart. Okay. And this is a big giveaway feature, which is in this image, the headland between the overlap between this headland and Mount Stewart is huge. Look, all this bit is overlap. And here, we hardly get any overlap. The headland's finished. Well, you're on when I was doing the measuring and say, oh, hang on a minute. I haven't hit the headland. There's open water between the viewpoint and Mount Stewart. There should be a headland in the way. So when you look at this, yeah, there is open water. That's why we're seeing it. But we need this to be somewhere where we hit the headland when we're pointing at Mount Stewart. So that starts to make you think about which side you should be. Where should you be? You know you're on the coastline but you want to hit a headland before you see Mount Stewart. So you're gonna to want to be a bit over this direction, aren't you? Notice that we are not photo fitting to get this information. We're using our brains and a map that points to places of reference we choose in the 3D view. We're using the map an awful lot. It's not just voodoo with photo fitting at all. It's, it's common sense. So let's try for the last question. We're trying to suggest where we think we are then. We know we're not at this test point. So where are we? Well, we need, we've got a few constraints that we've picked up from the imagery that we've confirmed with our distance and line of sight work we can do with Peak Visor using the um, distance finding and the pointing at things and teleporting to them. So we know that we've got some conditions and we need to, to actually fulfill all of them. So we need a headland that is in line with Mount Stewart. Here's Mount Stewart. That's presumably things that can look like the headland. So that area in there will give us some intervening piece of land sticking out that will be on a line with Mount Stewart. So this is all about finding things you can identify as points of reference in the photo and starting to reason about them. We're pointing along a left-hand shoreline at the 794 metre peak there. So we need something where we're pointing along a left-hand shoreline. That's three options. Each one of those places, you would be looking at that peak along a left-hand shoreline. When we were here, we didn't have a shoreline. So that can't be right. So we want to satisfy that, both of those things. There's only one position here that satisfies both those constraints at the same time. And that's this one. 
it does see a headland and it sees a headland that's very distant. And if you remember, when I measured it, the headland was quite a long way away. So that measurement will probably match. We're also, we've got the right line of sight along here. So that's looking like a good option. And if you go and take the coordinates of that new place, which is actually very, very close, this is what it does to your photo fits. And you can try all of this yourselves afterwards, but I'm aware we're running over. So you will get these photo fits. Now, how much distance do you think we have to have traveled to get such an improvement in our photo fit? Long way? That's the composite panorama. This is the new location. It's just this far away. And what's interesting when you start to look at the new location, that's the latitude of it. That's the longitude of it. It's really not far away at all. It happens to be on a walking trail. Someone was asking, what are those funny little dotted lines? They're usually walking trails because remember this was built by walkers, hikers, mountaineers. So these little trails, guess what? It makes a lot of sense that we're exactly there for another reason, which is that that's on the walking trail. It's where the trail hits the bay. Okay, so that makes us feel better as well. And if we flick to, we'll see if this works. This is Google Earth web. So you don't install it. And the joy of it is that it is uh, something we can all share. So in theory, we could all be logged onto this and share the map and you could put clues on and I could put clues on. It's a great way to work. It needs some discipline. So I'm clicking on this location here, which is the new one. And here we are looking at our shared map. That's where we thought it was. That was the test location that we were asked to verify and we rejected it. This is the new location. And we can take a ruler and see how far apart they are. Less than 750 meters. So all of that change in our photo fits took place in less than a kilometer. And then the really annoying part to this story is I did it with Peak Visor. I found the new location. It turned out to fit beautifully and I was convinced that I was in the right place. And then my pal that actually asked me to help went and found a photo online at that exact place. And therefore he didn't need my help. But on the other hand, he did verify exactly what Peak Visor had said, because this is that location. And you can see perfectly the headland in the way to Mount Stewart. You can see the curvature in the bay. You can see uh, this wiggly coastline on a straight line with the peak that's 764 meters here. So although it was irritating not to have helped him because he found it himself, there aren't always going to be exact photos for everywhere you want to find. And Peak Visor's strength is that we were flying blind and we found a place that's absolutely corroborated by photos in Google. And if you do a bit more work and go to this place in um, Google Maps, you can actually find the little bit where the, the woods uh, give way to the trail and you can see that this is the closest part of the bay. So really quite an impressive feet of uh, accuracy on the part of peak visor peak visor can always get there whether there are photos or not and the accuracy in peak visor is good and getting better so look here here's the composite photo here's the actual shot from google now what parameters different about these two images they're similar we know it's the same place they look pretty good but What's, what's different about the photos? Can you think of the seven parameters we've learned about 
which one's probably changed across these two images. And a little clue would be to say, look at the edges. Is there a bit more fitted in here? How are we looking at more of a spread? Is that an, a wider angle here? This looks as though it's um, a bit of a fisheye lens, doesn't it? You can see the effect on this. It looks like one of those estate agent photos. So which one of those do you think has uh, the greater value? And we're thinking that it's a uh, field of view and that probably the field of view is, um, is greater in the top. But these images are sufficiently close for us to be very confident that Peak Visor has taken us somewhere uh, with a great deal of accuracy. And that is why uh, I think it's worth all the grief we went to, 750 meter correction, because it tells us what Peak's Visor's strengths and weaknesses are. So on the one hand, we've seen it can deliver Eric's bad research if we don't use it properly. You know you need to be experienced to photo fit well, you've just found out. It's very demanding on the machine and the bandwidth. And yeah, there's limited pre-release testing, as someone pointed out. Very true. But it's also capable of great accuracy. It has a very valuable data set that's open to us through an API. The dual view interface is very powerful when you're trying to get your head around these stuff. And it's more authentic than Google in terms of the terrain rendering when you're on the ground. So I hope today, as we conclude, that you think Peak Visor was worth learning that you appreciate it's always going to be upgrading and that um, you're going to take part in us developing it for the OSINTH community. Thank you very much for staying with us.